we simply cannot allow people to pour into the United States undetected, undocumented, unchecked. And complete the dang fence. This bill that we will sign today is not a revolutionary bill. Cast down your bucket where you are. We come from France. And I am, you know, adamantly against illegal immigrants. They're coming in by the thousands, just unbelievable. A Deal. wall is an immorality. Who are you rooting for? Those masters of the universe are at it again. You maniac! You blew it up! Welcome to Parsing Immigration Policy, the podcast of the Center for Immigration Studies. My name is Mark Krikorian, Executive Director of the Center. Today, we're going to talk about something that may seem wonky. It's the new fee schedule for U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Services. Do not turn the podcast off. We are not going to be talking just about how much it costs to file various forms. The point of the paper that we released this week by Elizabeth Jacobs, one of our analysts, and she's going to talk about it, is not just the specifics of this fee went up and this fee went down. It's what do those decisions tell us about the administration's policy preferences? Because you often hear discussion of how the tax code is used to support certain behaviors and you know uh, dissuade or disincentivize others. And there is a certain amount of that, like the mortgage interest deduction, what have you. But in U.S. CIS fees, there's actually an objective yardstick to measure this against because, and Liz will talk about this, the law says that the agency is supposed to set a fee based on what it actually costs to process that particular application. Different applications have different requirements. Some take more work, some take less work. Therefore, some cost more, some cost less for the agency to process, and the agency is supposed to cover its costs. But this administration is not following that rule, and so you can tell, you can see, compared to what an application costs to adjudicate, are they actually charging that or not? And that tells us basically what they want more of and maybe even what they want less of. And so Liz is uh, here in the studio to talk about it. Thanks for coming in, Liz. And if you could just tell us, first of all, what's the kind of general point of this report that you did and that we posted this week on the site? Thank you for having me. Sure. Well, let's start with discussing how this 2024 fee rule is being used to further Biden administration policy objectives. And it's doing that in a number of ways. First, it's setting up new fees that it's going to charge U.S. businesses who access USCIS services to help pay for the border crisis in general, but specifically the asylum division and new programs that the Biden administration has set up to transfer some of the workload that's normally handled by the Department of Justice to USCIS. So essentially, they're looking for deep pockets to fund the border crisis is kind of what it amounts to. Exactly. The way the agency has described it is that they are shifting from a more beneficiary pays model of a fee schedule to one that is ability to pay model, meaning that they will charge more to beneficiaries that they believe are able to pay more. Right. Rather than adjusting the fees proportionally across the immigration system based on the cost of adjudication. So so just before you continue the law does the law say that each application needs the cost needs to reflect the cost of processing every application or is it just that USCIS has to cover its costs kind of collectively through fees So not exactly the agency derives its authority and direction to collect fees from section 286M of the Immigration and Nationality Act and that directs USCIS to establish and change, collect, or deposit fees into an account called the Immigration Examinations Fee Account to fund the cost of, and I quote, fairly and efficiently adjudicating immigration benefit requests, including those provided without charge to refugee, asylum, and certain other applicants or petitioners. 
So there is some room in the law to add costs to forms that do not derive directly from their cost of adjudication or the, their costs of services right. um, in order to pay for certain humanitarian benefits. So they have some flexibility there. And that is where the Biden administration has taken some flexibility and right. really flipped it on its head in order to prioritize the types of immigration benefits that they find politically favorable. So to another, them. another example, basically, of some discretion that they have that they're now punching through and using it for much broader purposes than intended. Yes. Essentially, I mean, before you continue, they've gone from a model which all previous administrations used, well, at least as the kind of overarching model of charging what an application costs, with certain exceptions, humanitarian reasons, to a kind of broader approach that, that Karl Marx would have expressed as from each according to his ability to each according to his needs. In other words, um, they're charging more to people who they think can pay more. Yeah. So most of the most dramatic fee increases will be seen by individuals or businesses seeking employment-based visas, mm -hmm. specifically U.S. businesses and employers who petition for foreign workers have to file certain forms with USCIS. And they are increasing fees for these groups in two ways. They are both disproportionately increasing the amount that these groups have to pay for these services. And then for each form filed, in many cases, they created a new fee that will also be attached called the asylum program fee. And before you ask, no, this is not a fee for an asylum application per se. These Individuals that will be paying this fee may have no connection whatsoever to asylum services or the asylum division of USCIS. It is just designed to bring in more money to help the Biden administration fund new regulations and systems that they have created within USCIS to address the border crisis. And in our view, that is enabling the Biden administration to continue with bad border policies by um, finding new funding sources to address the problems that this has caused. Right. So in order to uh, basically process border jumpers faster, they're charging businesses whether they have anything to do with that whole process or not. In other words, businesses applying for legal workers are paying for illegal immigration is kind of what it boils down to. Yes, and DHS stated that they have made this decision because employers and businesses have essentially deeper pockets. They have a greater ability to pay. Let's contrast that with what the Trump administration attempted to do to bring in revenue for the asylum division. They attempted in their 2020 rule that never went into effect to charge a nominal $50 fee for an asylum application and include a fee waiver for those who could not pay it so that the program itself would bring in some money. That is an option that uh, the Biden administration chose not to take. And instead, they have decided to charge all employers who have more than 25 employees $600 for each form they file on top of the already drastic increase in their form fees. And then smaller Companies with 25 employees or less, $300 for each additional form, and they have decided to exempt nonprofit organizations entirely from this fee. So just to give a sense, what are some of the, the scale of the increases in fees for some of these um, employment-based visas? So yes, like I said, employers and businesses who want to bring in foreign workers are going to see the highest fee increases. Some examples that are really prominent are um, with H-1B applications. We will see those fees go from about $460 to $780, which is a 70% increase. And that is not including the asylum program fee that will be tacked on for another $600 on top of that. Wow, wow, okay. For L-1 workers, which are generally managers, those fees will increase about 200% or from $460 to $1,385. And then, of course, that is excluding the asylum program fee. So another $600 on top of that. Wow. And for aliens who are seeking admission on an O visa or for exceptional 
performers in certain professions, those fees will increase 129% or from $460 to $1,055. And you got to add $600 more on top of all of that. So we're talking some of these fees are going to triple or quadruple the actual amount of money you have to pay. Now, I just want to insert, I actually don't necessarily mind some of these employment visas costing a lot more because I don't think we should have them at all. But it just seems to me as a principle, it ought to be done in a more even-handed way so that everybody knows what to expect and everybody's treated similarly. And that's, that's what it seems to me is the unfairness is the issue. I don't really care whether companies petitioning for an H-1B visa have to pay more. I don't want any of those. I'd, I'd rather have zero H-1B visas. But if you're going to do it, it seems like it should be done in an even-handed way with a consistent rule rather than just basically charging as much as you think people can possibly pay. The dramatic fee increases for employment-based visas um, is partly an effort in order to suppress fees for other immigration benefits. Right, yeah. Um, primarily benefits that fall under what we call the humanitarian docket, so relief from deportation, asylum, for victims of violence, for witnesses in crimes, those types of benefits. But also, it is in part to help bring in more money to pay for the expansion of humanitarian benefits, but including the Biden administration's use of humanitarian parole. We've covered many times on this podcast and on our website and on our blog, how the Biden administration since 2021 has created at least eight that I'm counting, but perhaps more today, right. um, parole programs to bring in an admissible aliens. Those aliens who are paroled in will also be eligible to receive work authorization. While they have to apply and pay for work authorization in most cases, um, it's still draining USCIS resources, manpower, and increasing processing times across the immigration system as a whole in order to accommodate these new programs that are not authorized by Congress. Right, right, exactly. So it's another, it's another basically it's just another way of saying much of their decision-making in coming up with this new schedule of fees was to find a way to pay for the border crisis that they have created. Before we go on to more of this, just a little bit about under the Trump administration, they did try to update fees, right? Because in 2016, you had said was the last time the fees had been updated. And there's been like 26% roughly inflation since then. And that's really puts these two and 300% increases into context. But the Trump administration tried to update the fees. What happened with that? And so why is this happening now, eight years after the last update? Yeah, that's correct. In 2020, the Trump administration finalized their fee schedule. It, generally speaking, across the board, increased immigration benefit fees by about 20%. And that fee schedule was challenged in federal court and enjoined by two courts, one in the Northern District of California. Of course. And <laughs> the second case was in the District of the District of Columbia. So both federal courts. And in both cases, the courts issued preliminary injunctions so that temporarily stopped implementation of the rule from moving forward because they believed that the plaintiffs show that they were likely to succeed in their claims that the secretary or acting secretary at the time, Chad Wolf, was not properly appointed. So he oh, did not have authority to issue this rule. So the lawsuits weren't based on the substance of the fee schedule. But who no, sued? They, they, words, were, they were both. Yeah, that okay. bo um, the courts found both that the secretary did not have the authority to issue the fee schedule, but also it likely violated substantive provisions of the Administrative Procedure Act on the basis that the agency had not thoroughly considered all of the reliance interests in keeping fees Right. Lower. But, but in a sense, and if you sort of don't know the background here, that's fine. But 
was that lawsuit basically a way just for businesses to to avoid paying higher fees? In other words, who was paying the lawyers making those arguments? Was it a kind of immigrants' rights folks who you know didn't want immigrants to have to pay more, or was it businesses who were basically worried about what they were going to have to pay? In those cases, the plaintiffs were what I would categorize as immigrant advocacy organizations. Okay. And many were able to obtain standing because of a concept called organizational standing. Basically, their membership would suffer, or that was the claim. We are expecting, however, the 2024 fee rule to be challenged in court, but this time by a different group of plaintiffs. Many business lobbying associations or businesses themselves have indicated an intent to challenge the rule. To contest the disproportionate fee increases, some have publicly stated that they don't believe that law-abiding employers should be forced to shoulder the costs of the border crisis and policies that have allowed it to perpetuate. And that's kind of ironic because what it does is it kind of puts immigration hawks on the same side as some of these employment immigration lobbyists because obviously immigration hawks couldn't care less if employers you know if it costs more to import workers to compete with americans on the other hand the idea of requiring people trying to bring in legal workers to subsidize the administration's illegal immigration program is pretty absurd on its face yes exactly and mark you're hitting on a point that i also make in this paper and that is it's trying to use the outrage or discomfort that businesses will experience because of this fee rule to motivate businesses to lobby to Congress on USCIS's behalf for taxpayer appropriations. USCIS is typically not funded by Congress. They are funded by fees, and that is deliberate. Um, Congress created USCIS as a fee-funded agency to mitigate the cost that the U.S. immigration system has on U.S. taxpayers. Right. That's why in 1996, Congress declared a policy statement in law saying that self-sufficiency is a basic principle of the United States immigration law since the country's earliest immigration statutes and that it should continue to be a governing principle in the United States. But there are little winks and nods throughout the fee rule language that suggests that, however, if the asylum division does receive funding from Congress, it can take away this asylum program free from employers. It can reduce fees. Oh, interesting. So they are giving- Blackmail, kind of. Yeah, they're giving fodder to the businesses and the associations that may be angry about this to call their representative and say, why do we have to pay for this? Why can't we just- Fund them or provide taxpayer based funding. Taxpayers funded, basically. Yeah. yeah interesting. Which is interesting. A strategy that we see businesses do all the time. Right, right. But never in the immigration context specifically. Right. Um, another topic I want to highlight, if we have time, is how the Biden administration has been using the fee rule to subsidize naturalization specifically. The right. Biden administration has articulated over and over again since 2021 that increasing naturalizations is one of their highest priorities. Especially in the run-up to Election Day. Yes. And they're using the fee rule to push this by um, giving a big discount to the majority of naturalization applicants. So what this rule does is it says that if you make 400 percent of the federal poverty guidelines or less, you will only have to pay 50 percent of what we determined naturalization application should cost. And the naturalization applications are already suppressed below the increase in inflation rates since 2016. Uh, So it is increasing here, but it's less than the inflation compared to 2016. That's right. Right. Interesting. But 400 percent of poverty, that's, I mean, you're not really poor if you're making quadruple the poverty rate, but nonetheless, you get a discount. We at CIS crunched the numbers to try to figure out about how many people would this affect? Because like you said, 400% of FPG is not that low. Right. 
So an individual is considered to have an income of 400% of FPG if they make- FPG's Federal Poverty Guidelines, thank right? Thank you. Yeah. If they make a little over 60000 a year or less. So for one person, the household of one, you don't have yes. any dependents, you would get the 50% discount for applying for naturalization if you made 60000 or less. Unbelievable. A household size of two people, you would get that discount if you made- $81,000 per year or less. Family of four would get the discount if they make $124,000 per year or less. And I think this is important to highlight because the rationale that DHS provided in offering this discount was kind of flimsy. It said that it is offering the discount after considering the comments it received from the public to provide additional relief to longtime residents who struggle to pay naturalization fees without requiring further fee increases for other forms to offset the costs. And then they added that the fee increase income threshold for a reduced naturalization fee would also enable the United States to further benefit from newly naturalized citizens, including their greater civic involvement and tax revenues. The tax revenues part doesn't make a ton of sense because if you're eligible to naturalize, that means you already have a green card. Right. If you have a green card, you are already able to work in the United States. And there are very few employment opportunities that are allowed to disqualify you on the basis of your citizenship. Right. Yeah, basically, yeah. Your income isn't going to go up just because now you can get a job at the post office. I yeah. Mean, it's sort of ridiculous. Maybe in Washington, D.C., that is an exception because right. we have so many government jobs here that require citizenship or other sensitive types of work that may require citizenship. But generally, it's very speculative at best to say that tax revenue would increase on the basis of increased naturalization. It's just the rationale for their policy preference of wanting to get more green card holders to be citizens, which you know isn't a bad thing. If you're here and you live here, you should become a citizen. But essentially what they're trying to do is subsidize naturalization so that more this is just me talking, but more potential voters of theirs are able to register to vote. Yeah. So the greater civic involvement that they cited yeah, exactly. is very obvious that that would increase. But how many people would benefit? We estimated that about roughly 65% of green card holders who would be eligible to naturalize have incomes at 400% of poverty or lower. So that is the majority of applicants in the country. So they're giving a discount to two thirds of all the people who could be applying, which is kind of ridiculous. Of course, how much this is going to cost the agency is dependent on how many people in the future apply for naturalization. That number is speculative, but based on our estimates, for example, in 2023, USCIS naturalized 878,000 new citizens. So using that number and assuming about 65% of future applicants will get the fee reduction, the loss in revenue would be about $200 million annually. Wow. Well, sorry, Which $203 then, million dollars well, annually. Yeah, but, so they then have to make that up by doing other things. Uh, Correct. Like charging businesses more than they right. should be paying. And increasing other fees, the regular base fees even more. So uh, one thing was interesting that you touched on in the report was that they have now expanded the number of applications that don't have any fee at all, that are just exempt from fees, which again is just one more area that has to be covered by everybody else's fees. So what was going on with that? Yeah. So another change this rule made was it took a lot of form or immigration benefit types that were eligible to receive fee waivers for and just made them fee exempt entirely. For everybody. Yeah, so you so don't have to demonstrate you needed a waiver. They just sort of said, well, there's no fee, forget about it. Yeah. And as I understand it, the difference between a fee waiver and a fee exemption may sound subtle, but it dramatically impacts the agency's ability to make money off of an immigration benefit. It also means that an applicants don't have to demonstrate that they are not able to pay for these benefits, meaning if they are subject to the public charge ground of inadmissibility or deportability, that um, this is one less thing to worry about. Uh, because you're supposed to be able to demonstrate you can carry your own weight, basically. And if you submit an application for a fee waiver, you got to say, well, I'm too poor to pay this fee. Well, if you're too poor to pay 
the fee, then how can we consider you able to support yourself more broadly? Because, you know, your annual grocery bill and your rent is going to cost a lot more than whatever this fee is. Correct. Well, and while the Biden administration's public charge policies don't specifically request that applicants provide fee waiver information, if that information is in the file, the public charge rule does require officers to consider all relevant information, which would include fee waiver receipts in the past or requests for the future. So basically, it's another way of making sure immigrants on welfare can still get in or stay, kind of. Yes, but of course, this does not apply to all immigration benefits. Right. Some are not exempt from the public charge requirements. Right. But it does demonstrate another area where USCIS could be taking in money from people who do have the ability to pay and are affirmatively choosing not to. Right, right. Yeah, exactly. So because the point is, some of these applications okay, maybe most of the people who are submitting them are low income, but not necessarily. It's the same thing with uh, asylum. You had mentioned earlier that the Trump administration had tried to implement a modest fee, almost a nominal fee for asylum, which would have been waived if you really couldn't pay it. But not everybody applying for asylum is poor. I mean, you know, I mean, I've seen people who Last year in Arizona, a group of people from the Republic of Georgia who had flown from Paris to Cancun and bought a round ticket, round trip ticket, and then taken a bus from Cancun and kind of written off the return ticket just as a way to get to the U.S. border. Those people were not poor, and yet they wouldn't be paying and are not now paying a fee for an asylum application if they bother to file one. Yes, under that structure, the point of an asylum fee was not in any way to punish asylum applicants or deter potential asylum applicants from filing applications. It was to bring in revenue for a system that is incredibly costly to the agency from individuals who are able to pay. And of course, those fees were kept, like you mentioned, to a nominal level, which was I think set to be fifty dollars and waivable if you were unable to. But that never went into effect, like you said, because of the court rulings. Now, this is ways that you described the administration wants to both bring in more money, but also shift who's paying. But USCIS's costs have gone up too, right? In other words, this administration is placing way more demands on USCIS through its various illegal parole programs. Isn't that correct? That's correct. The parole programs is one major area where the Biden administration is increasing agency costs and drains on on its workforce. Another area that USCIS has increased costs for the agency overall is the expansion of temporary protected status or TPS that has expanded both in number of countries and number of people eligible to historic bounds that we haven't seen before, or certainly not in recent decades. The USCIS ombudsman, who is entirely separate from USCIS, that office is within DHS, not USCIS specifically, so they are able to talk about things a bit more neutrally, had categorized the Biden administration's expansion of its humanitarian DACA, including its use of quote-unquote humanitarian parole TPS and other benefits as directly increasing processing times across the board for the immigration system for allowing the affirmative asylum docket to experience a backlog of over a million cases. I think we're at at this point. Back when that report was issued, it was in the 800,000s, and that also was historic for June 2023. But now our sources tell us that backlogs increased to over a million. And this has real impacts on the legal immigration system because if you were to affirmatively file for asylum today, your application may not be processed for over a decade. That is wow. the ombudsman's estimate, not our estimate. An affirmative application is people who are legally here on some kind of temporary status and then apply because, say, you know, there was a coup in their home country or something and their uncle was the minister who was overthrown or some such thing like that. In other words, 
affirmative asylum applications are not the people jumping the border. They're the people who are already here legally, correct? Yes. The best way to understand affirmative asylum applications is in contrast to the other type, which is defensive. And right. that means that a defensive asylum application submitted in defense to removal. Right. You're an illegal alien and you make the case in court, don't deport me because now I want to apply for asylum. Yeah. In court or to a CBP officer at the border right. or to ICE, um, rather than you are here legally or perhaps your status is expiring soon and you believe you will be persecuted on account of a protected ground if you are returned. Right. So it's not just these affirmative asylum applications. Like you said, everything in the legal immigration system is slowed down by the administration's border crisis policies. In fact, I um, just recently had lunch with a guy, U.S. citizen, born on this side but grew up on the Mexican side. His wife is a Mexican citizen, so it's a legit thing. There's no, um, you know, it's not a fraud issue, and yet they've been waiting months and months and months to get their paperwork. In fact, I think a couple of years, precisely because all of these border jumpers are basically not just jumping the border, but they're in a sense jumping the line and USCIS is taking care of them before legitimate legal immigrants married to US citizens. This happened back a while ago when the DACA program initially went into effect. So this is more than a decade ago now. Apparently, the, and the New York Times did a whole story on this. The category that experienced the most delays because of processing all the DACAs were the spouses of U.S. citizens, which is the one category everybody's for, and frankly, in my opinion, should be at the front of the line. And yet they were pushed to the back of the line. Seems to be happening again this time. One area where that is obvious is with work authorization applications, responding to pushback from a lot of local governments that are trying to manage large numbers of migrants that have arrived recently to their cities or states. USCIS has made an affirmative decision to prioritize the work authorization applications for individuals who have humanitarian parole status. So that includes people who are inadmissible to the United States or being flown in or paroled out of custody at the border. So the agency has sold their policy as it was intended to help Ukrainians and Afghans who had been paroled to the United States for humanitarian reasons, but their policy is broader than that. And it is allowing those applications to be put ahead in line before a work authorization application from someone who has a legal immigration status. Right. Yeah. Which is unbelievable. I mean, um, and the, you, you're talking about the groups, the kind of people that we had that Todd Benzman, our colleague, had done a report about the number of people flying in who are inadmissible but are given travel authorization by this administration and then paroled into the country. Their work authorization applications basically take priority over people who are lawfully here and applying for work authorization. It's really, it's pretty unbelievable. So this goes into effect Next week, I believe, is that correct? April 1st? April 1st, right. 2024. So I assume the lawsuits will will follow very quickly and it may or even precede that and this may not go into effect at all. So we'll see whether there's more to talk about this in the future if this even ends up going into effect. But thanks for coming in and talking to us about this. And I hope people understand that this is kind of a window onto the administration's thinking and policy preferences rather than just sort of a dry list of numbers and bureaucratic fees and uh, bureaucratic form names. So we're going to have the, we'll link to the report in the show notes. It'll be on our site at cis.org. Thank you, Liz, for coming in and uh, walking us through this, frankly, pretty important issue, but something that usually only lobbyists and immigration lawyers really pay attention to. Thank you, Mark. And finally, I just wanted to vent very briefly about this recent bridge disaster in Baltimore and the way it's being used, frankly, by people on both sides of the immigration debate. There have been some fringe folks on the immigration control and low immigration side saying, look, the ship had a crew from India, therefore immigration is bad. It's a stupid argument, but it's a fringe thing. It's a, you know, handful of random 
people on Twitter who don't have actual pictures or names in their accounts. On the other hand, on the other side, prominent people in the immigration debate, researchers, think tank people, activists, are pointing to the fact that there were, I think it was uh, at the latest count, half a dozen members of a road crew that was on the bridge and that appears to have perished, that the fact that they were immigrants somehow is a rationale for weak enforcement and unlimited future immigration. These are, frankly, equally stupid arguments. There may be policy implications from this bridge disaster relating to, you know, container ships and bridge construction. I have no idea. It's not my area. But there are no policy conclusions to draw from this tragedy. It's frankly kind of ghoulish before the bodies of these men have even gotten cold that people at the Cato Institute and elsewhere are trying to use their tragic deaths, which are a personal tragedy for their families and their friends, as some kind of political cudgel to justify the disastrous immigration policies of the Biden administration and to call for even more disastrous policies. So, you know, not everything that happens relates to immigration, even though immigration overall, immigration policy is one of these meta issues. Some things really don't have anything to do with immigration policy, even if there's an immigrant involved. Sigmund Freud used to say, sometimes a cigar is just a cigar. And sometimes a tragedy in which some people born abroad happen to have died is just a tragedy, not an immigration policy teaching moment. Anyway, that's all. I, I just wanted to get that off my chest. This is Mark Krikorian, Center for Immigration Studies. This is our podcast, Parsing Immigration Policy. Please subscribe if you're listening to this on our website. Just subscribe on your podcast platform of choice. If you can rank or review us there, some of them allow that, some of them don't, please do. And in any case, if you have complaints, compliments, story ideas, or interview ideas, feel free to email us at center at cis.org. Until next week, this is Mark Gregorian. Mm-hmm.